Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm going to start. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, uh, thank you very much for giving me the occasion to come and talk a bit about some uh, of the research work we are doing at IREN on free software. That I, and I do hope to, to show you something that could be uh, interesting for everybody. But first, a few words about IREN. What, what's this place? Well, IREN is, is a research center which is in Paris today, which I believe is a kind of a special, pla a special place for a free open source software and uh, all people that like it. Uh, basically, we are uh, a few researchers, uh, people like Vincent Bala, Albert Cohen, Julia Laval, that you know well, Stefano Zakiroli, uh, who do research but are extremely uh, fond of free software. We like hacking, we like uh, the values behind free software, and we try to bridge a bit the communities of people doing research on one side, the people developing free software on the other. So a, a kind of uh, schema of the, what we really like to do, and I, I hope to show you that this is really reality, not just a picture. We, we like to work with some free and open source software project, look at the different kind of problems that can arise there, then pick some of these problems which can be interesting as a research problem, do some research work in there. Uh, of course, as researcher, you publish some papers, which is typically our, our, uh, how we are uh, evaluated, so we need to do it. But we don't stop there. We try to come up with some kind of prototype, test it on real uh, world uh, situation. And if it works well, then work together with the uh, open source community to, to get it adopted somehow. Uh, I, I mean, the, the, the example of the work that Julia did is, is a beautiful example of these kind of things. For example, Coxinel, I, I, I will not uh, spend more words on this apart for just a little comment. Julia was extremely good in hiding from you all the very tough research details, uh, all the details on how actually this matching algorithm has been developed and how can you adapt a model, sophisticated model checking algorithm to make sure it goes fast on millions of lines of code. I mean, she just showed you a tool. Okay? But behind the tool, there is a lot of work. I mean, it's, uh, it's really fantastic that it works. Then you have some other people, Albert, for example, he works a lot on, to, on uh, adding to compilers you are using, GCC, LLVM, uh, everything which is necessary to properly exploit multi-core archi architecture by doing uh, automatic parallelization. And this is based on polyhedral optimization, which is, uh, uh, again, tough math, but the important thing is that after you compile, things go fast. I mean, that's and then the, uh, our focus today, I decided to pick one subject, and uh, one subject I like a lot is working with people and come from GNU Linux distribution, seeing the kind of problem uh, that are in there and try to see if we can improve, uh, simplify the work for users and of uh, Linux distribution, for maintainers uh, of uh, Linux distribution. So to make sure this distribution can scale up, be released faster and have a better quality assurance. Um, so I will focus on this and the part, uh, the kind, of the different highlights of research I'm going to show to you are actually work uh, we did together with all the people on this picture. Yeah. By the way, I don't know if you already know Stefano, for example. He has been the Debian project leader for three years. He is now working in our uh, university in IRI also. So GNU Linux distribution, what, what is this? Of course, you know very well because you are working for SUSE, but basically GNU Linux distribution are a smart idea coming from the 90s to try to industrialize free and open source software. Okay, so the old ways for old guys like me, having not so many hairs uh, and white beard, uh, I pretty well remember the ages when uh, I wa it was necessary to install a software in your machine, you had to go on not even on the web, just on the internet, by FTP, with somebody on the phone telling you, go to this particular IP address, you will find the source code. You compile it on your machine, and then when you compile it on your machine, you find actually the configure doesn't work because you are missing this and that version of that particular library, so you go and fetch something else on the other side. So it was a very amusing way of spending your weekend back in ages where we didn't have uh, Twitter and YouTube and all these other uh, time-consuming uh, applications. But then, I mean, that was a mess. It was not possible to reproduce exactly the, the uh, I mean, every machine had rather different configuration from the other one because 
depending on where we were fetching the new libraries, so you didn't get the same version. It was a mess. You remember it very well, I hope. No, I hope not. I hope you didn't leave this. Uh, and then in the 90s, somebody came up with a with very nice idea of having, I mean, factoring out all this work, tacking upstream, do, doing testing, configuration, etc. And so from the sources build packages which can be easily installed on user machines. And that was a business of the distribution. So having intermediate software vendors that do all this work for the others. Well, actually, that was an idea that started in 91, 92. Huh? So you had uh, Slackware. Who remembers this? I mean, Debian, <laughs> you're using it. You see, oh, fantastic. Uh, you see, it, it is not dead. Huh? And the line it goes up there. So you, you are a witness of this. But uh, so it has been a very successful idea. If you check around, you will see hundreds of different distributions. Of course, many are well known, but you have different ones that are targeted to, to handling routers or for handling game machines, etc. It's a very successful idea. But at the, her, at the heart of the notion of distribution lie two key concepts. One is the, the, the concept of package, we have seen before, and the other is a set of tools you use to install and maintain packages, which are package managers. What's a package? Well, you know, I know, I'm sure everybody knows, but let me just recall. Basically, in a package, you have a, a set of files which will be installed on your machine, some scripts which are executed when you do installation and removal to, to set up the configuration, and very importantly, some metadata that tells you actually what you need. For This is a, a, a real-life example of a simple package extracted from my Damian machine. You have the name of the package, a particular terminal here, its version, a section, the size in kilobytes on when it is installed, the people you have to bug when it, this doesn't work, the kind of architecture it is supposed to work on, and these red things are the important things that say, well, actually, if you really want to, to, to install this package, you need also to get a particular version of libc 6 which is more recent than this one, and then you'd need to get either this version, this library, or a recent version of Xlips, and then you cannot properly run this package if you have a too old version of SUID manager installed on your machine. You know, this kind of metadata is part of it. Now, packages are the elemental component for our modern distributed system, distribution system, and for example, on my machine, I have more or less something like 2,000 packages already installed, just to, for Use, usual life, okay? Now, if you look at what this means, uh, probably when you use a package manager, you don't notice it, but when you start looking at how things actually work, uh, if you do want to do something so easy, like playing backgammon here, you want to install this backgammon package, then you might need to spool a few strings. This messy picture, I mean, the, the spaghetti dish, here is a kind of a visualization of uh, the dependencies of, of uh, this GNU Backgammon package. So GNU Backgammon is this green, uh, green spot here, and then you have direct dependencies, which are the, the one highlighted. But each of the dependencies has extra dependencies and conflicts, etc. So if you really pull all the strings, you are going, just to play Backgammon, you are going to pull in hundreds of different other packages or, or try to find them. But luckily, most of these packages are already on your machine, so when you do need to play the game, you do not need to pull all the string because somebody already did it for you. But it's not so easy. And on the other side, the number of packages that you find in a, a current distribution has grown in an exponential way over years. So here you have just a plot of the number of packages which are available in subsequent releases of the Debian distribution for which I have the data. So I started with a few, few tens of packages back in 92, 93. Uh, it was uh, over 20,000 packages in Debian Squeeze, and it is, in the latest version, almost 40,000 packages, okay? So when you have such a large collection of software, maintaining it becomes a, a, a difficult problem, even using it. So using manual package installation or review is not going to work anymore, so you need some kind of semi-automated tools, and this is where things start getting interesting, okay? So if you really want to make sure distribution can grow properly, you need advanced tools for several things. One, on the user side, provide you with packet managers that allows you to install the software you want in the way you want. 
I mean, according to your needs and your policies. And on the distribution editor side, you need to have a quality assurance infrastructure that allows you to make sure the quality of the assembly of packages you are providing to the user is as high as possible. So for example, you should never ship a CD, you don't do CDs anymore, but I mean, you should never ship a distribution containing packages that cannot be installed. What's the point of putting a package in there that has broken dependencies? You sh this should never happen. Should never happen. It happens, okay? So we, you need tools to make sure this doesn't happen. Then maybe you need to, to find out which packages will, when they are changed, have a large impact on the distribution. Uh, make sure you find compatibility issues. We see some of these. And so at IRE, we have worked on both of these areas. And so I, I will try to give you a few highlights of, of uh, what we have done here. Let's start on the user side, improving package managers. So do you believe package managers work well today? Are you happy with your package manager? Very happy, fantastic. Well, unfortunately, I'm an unlucky guy, so I'm not necessarily all the time happy. So these are a couple of examples of my real life. So uh, you don't, don't blame Debian. Don't just say it is just the fault of Debian. This, I could reproduce example with other distribution, just using mine, which is under Debian today. So um, once I tried to install this simple package, Baobab, which is a nice application that shows you the, the, uh, a graphic a picture showing the, the space used on your disk in a nice way. Okay? So I wanted to install it. So I call apt-get, tell him, please install Baobab on my machine. And what I get is this kind of thing here that basically say, no way, you will not get it. And the reason why we will not get it is that a package I didn't even mention or use, because uh, don't, don't tell everybody, but I'm a KDE user, I don't use GNOME. So I never installed GNOME. So I mean, there was a, this GNOME settings demo, which was going to break some GNOME screensaver in a version smaller than 2.28. Uh, okay, so get a, get a higher version. No, he says, no, I'm not going to get you a, a higher version. I, I, I will insist installing this. And so packages are broken, what do I do? Uh, well, yeah, I don't install uh, Baobab. Uh, okay. Or you spend the weekend uh, fiddling, trying to install this and forcing that to go up or something like this. That's a kind of uh, thing which is particularly annoying when you discover that actually there was a very, very simple solution for installing this if you were using the right algorithm. Okay? But then uh, it didn't work. Another kind of thing which is annoying is when you get a solution. So the, this package manager gives you what you want, but in a way that you don't like. This is another real life example from my nightmare list. So another day I wanted to install a, a package which is called Dev Helper. By the way, just a small set of scripts. Uh, so a package manager starts working on it, reading the package list, the building dependency tree, fantastic. And he says, okay, I will bring you the package you want, but to do this, I need to install all this extra set of packages here. Okay, this space is pretty cheap. I, I have one terabyte on, on, on my laptop, so go ahead, no problem. Then he says, I'm also going to remove all this set of packages here. <laughs> That's different. So, mm, let's see, you want to remove a frozen bubble, so you discover I have kids, so I was playing frozen bubble. Well, why not? Then you go down and you see remove X window system. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, really, I mean, <laughs> I just want a set of scripts there. <laughs> so <laughs> why, why are you doing this to me? So, so there are in other packages we've been installed. So luckily, before doing anything on my machine, the system just sums up the situation. So I will upgrade the 75 packages, install 80 new packages, remove 42. Uh, do you want to continue? What, what would you say? Uh, uh, no, <laughs> no way, stop. <laughs> I don't need to, to install the paper. Well, we'll come next week, we'll see, okay? Especially these kind of things, you know, Murphy's Law, this, is, this was actually happening when I was pre preparing a course for Monday, and this was on Friday night. So uh, what do you do? I don't know, Friday night? No, stop. <laughs> I'll do it another day, okay? 
So now the big question is why these kind of things happen. Uh, one possible solution is Roberto is a very unlucky guy. Okay, so it only happens to him. No, no, it's not really the reality. The question is that if you ask yourself how difficult are package installation problems, how, how difficult it is to decide whether a package can be installed on your machine or not. Well, it was very surprising that when we got interested into looking into all this in 2006, there was no study, no answer whatsoever on anything like this. So the, the answer is bad news in some sense. So package installation, even in the simplest instance, I mean, you want to install a package and you are ready to scratch your machine and destroy everything which is on it just to have this single package in, on, on, on the machine. You are not asking anything, anything uh, sophisticated. Even that is already an NP-complete problem. Uh, how can you check it is an NP-complete problem? Actually, you can, you can make a very nice formal proof that uh, package installation and Boolean satisfiability are equivalent problem. So you, you take any Boolean formula whatsoever, you can translate it into a package repository, and the formula will be satisfiable if and only if a specific package in the repository is installable. Okay? So it's really a, a, a hard problem. And, and there is another way which is much more fun uh, to do the proof. Actually, you can encode the Sudoku uh, solving into package management. So there is a nice script that can produce from a Sudoku that you get on a newspaper, a nice repository, and then you call uh, your package manager and say, install a Sudoku, and the answer will be actually package 1112, et cetera, that tells you what you need to put in the uh, rows and columns. I mean, the, 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 this is left as an exercise. You, you, can play, you can play it if you want. And so, but this was just a simple question. That is to say, is it possible to install a package at all, even getting rid of uh, everything else on your main machine? This is not what you want to do when you want to install a package on your machine. In general, you have some high-level expectancies, uh, like uh, I will install a package, but don't touch the rest, or I install the package and get the latest version, or install this package and don't remove anything. Oh. So you finding a solution to the installation problem is NP complete, but if you want to really model installation upgrade, that's more difficult because there are many, many, many different ways of, of uh, installing packages. For example, imagine in your machine, uh, in your universe, you have uh, two versions of, of a certain set of packages. You have package Q1, Q2, Q3, Qn, uh, let's see, libc, uh, xlib, uh, libgtk, whatever, in version one and two. And then at some moment, you want to install a, a new component P that depends on all of these QIs. Okay. And you have version one of all the QIs installed on your machine. What should the package manager do? Well, it just needs to install P. But to install P, any of the two to the end configuration where you keep uh, all possible different versions of the QIs on your machine is a solution to your problem. Which, which, which solution do you want? It depends on who you are and what are your preferences. Uh, the, the paranoid solution, I mean, the solution you use on, on the Friday night uh, when you have a course uh, on Monday morning is to be paranoid, so just install P, but don't touch anything else, please. Don't try to upgrade or the rest. And then you have another solution when you are very a trendy guy, you want to have the best, best version of everything, which is, yes, please install P, and by the way, upgrade every dependency to the latest and best version. Of course, you can have these two extremes, but many, many other different possibility in, in, uh, in between. Okay, and actually, if you take all these issues into account, you will see that today, uh, for users, or package manager, dependency solving is not yet good enough. Okay. For many, many different reasons. One, there are still many dependency solvers and package managers out there that do not take into account that the Package management is, a, is an NP-complete problem. So you find some ad hoc algorithm around, for example, with a simple configuration like this one. I mean, don't take time to follow it. It will be on the slide that you can download. Just, just note that it is very easy for a human to find a way of installing A and B together. But if you call apt-get, it has a specific installation algorithm that will fail to install the, the things together. 
If you want to find out the solution you read, you need to have uh, a real solvers incorporated into your uh, package manager, basically SAT solver or constraint solver. And now many package managers like Zipper, which is used in SUSE DNF, which is going being adopted in Red Hat, Zero install, which is still another uh, package manager around, they do incorporate some SAT solver engine. Yeah, the, the SUSE one has a lib solver library, I believe. Uh, but uh, even if you do that, I mean, you, you understand you need to have a SAT solver or equivalent solver, fantastic, you put it in. But you don't provide the user with the flexibility and expressivi expressivity to define his policies. For example, can you use uh, your package manager, can you tell your package manager to find a solution that minimizes the installed size, that minimizes the download size, for example, that tries to align the version of binary packages that come from the same source package, that try to... Yeah. I agree. I, I, I will repeat this. Uh, sure, the, 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 the remark is, in the metadata for the packages, you have some extra information that tells you, for example, that some dependencies are optional. You don't really need them. I mean, there are some things which are recommends, which are strongly suggested, but not necessary, or suggests, which are suggested, but not strongly recommended. And so one possible way of minimizing installed size would be, for example, to avoid all these extra dependencies. But this is not the only situation because you can have alternative dependencies. To install a package, you might use a Apache or Tomcat or a light HTTP or whatever, and their size is not the same and has nothing to do with the suggestion or recommendation. It, I just need to choose one. And actually, it's a complex combinatorial problem to, to minimize this kind of size. Can you do this? Or can you tell the system, look, I really, really not want to see any downgrade. So find a way, maybe don't bring me the latest version of the package uh, I asked, but make sure you don't downgrade and you don't remove anything on my machine. Can you tell your package manager to do this today? In principle, not. Huh? Okay. And, uh, Actually, if you want to do this, you need a way to express your needs, to tell them to the package manager, and to, you need a solver who is able to, to do it properly. And by the way, don't forget, we are playing with NP-complete problems, so this is a moving target. So it's pretty nice to implement a particular state-of-the-art solver uh, algorithm today. It works. We tested it on current configurations. What happens in five years when the, the size of the package, uh, package repository will become 10 times bigger? Or when we uh, somebody has some fantastic new feature like multi-arch or um, cross-architectural dependency or whatever, that seem nice feature that change completely the shape of the optimization problem. Will it still work, this? So if you just want, want to implement one particular thing, then you need to be in touch with a researcher that works on solvers. And on the other hand, so on one side we have these issues with the package manager today. On the other hand, you have a vast research community which is working on constraint solvers, SAT solvers, but not only SAT solvers, uh, who is extremely eager to find real world instances, okay, because they want to check their algorithm, but unfortunately, often, they don't get real industrial data, or if they get real industrial data, it is under NDA, so they cannot publish the, the results, etc. They're very keen to this, see this example, and so I think we can close the gap. We started doing this at some point. How did you do, um, how did we do this? Well, we de defined a common, common format a pivot format for this uh, dependency installation upgrade problem, which is called the CUDF, Common Upgradability Description Format, where you can encode, I mean, this was designed in such a way that you can encode a uh, Debian package format, RPM package format, Eclipse plugin formats, feature diagrams, whatever. I mean, the, all different kinds of package formats into this uh, unified format here. And then from this, 
you can go not only to SAT solvers, but also to pseudo Boolean optimization solver, mixed integer linear programming solver, answer set programming solver, constraint programming solver. There are so many technologies around. Which is the one who will work exactly well? You don't know in principle. Okay. And, uh, and there is a library here that allows to manipulate this stuff. Once you do this, the idea was, was to have a package manager as modular, uh, using a modular architecture, so everything which is specific to your particular application is up to you, but everything which, it should, uh, which is related to solver should be isolated, modularized, and uh, uh, built in such a way that you can reuse pluggable solver as, uh, as much as you need. And you see, for example, here we have not only the request, what you want to install, but also user preferences, which is special in this uh, particular approach. And user preferences are something which are, uh, well, probably I will not go through all the slide here, but basically you can, you have keywords that allow you to select sets of packages, like for example, all the packages that will be installed, only the packages that will be changed, the packages that will be updated, downgraded, removed, the packages which are new, you, I can specify them. On top of them, I can add measurements, like for example, count the number of packages which are in this set, make a sum over of the integer value of the field uh, installed size of uh, the packages in this particular set. And then you can maximize or minimize this particular function and aggregate them to win in, in exographic order. I will, I will give you just a simple example. Don't, don't, don't spend too much time on this. And what is important is that for, uh, since two thou from 2008, we started a project that ended up in running a solver competition three years, one after the other, from two, 2010 to 2012, which was basically architecture this way. So you have users, me, you try to install something, it fails. Uh, you report uh, the issue to the distribution editor. The distribution editor will verify a report. So if you just uh, misspelled the name of the package, who cares? But if you really have an installation problem, I keep it. Uh, I convert it to this unified format. I submit to uh, our uh, central server. And then uh, once a year, we selected in the set of problems we, we got, the one which appeared to be difficult. For example, a simple strategy is you run the solver from last year's. Okay, if they succeed, that's not difficult. If they don't succeed, that's difficult. And you add the problem to the, to the problem set. Then you, 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 you call all the researchers around and say, look, there is a fantastic competition with the real world uh, data available. Do you want to come and, pl and play with us? They come and of course, they participate in the competition. And by the way, smart trick, if they want to participate in the competition, their solver must be able to speak CUDF. They must be able to use this particular format. Okay? So they give us improved algorithms, and since it's uh, improved algorithms are just solvers which are able to lead this um, particular format, well, they can be incorporated immediately as pluggable solvers in the, in the new version of the tools. And then you keep running the, this kind of circle. So we did it for three years, and now the outcome is uh, this is what you see in Debian, but you can package things in other place, places. We have already three pretty effective uh, pluggable solvers which are able to read this UDF format. One which is ASP code based on answer set programming, you see, not such solving. Uh, another which is based on mixed integer linear programming, MCCS, so again, not such solving. Another which is based on pseudo Boolean optimization, variant of such solving. So you can use one or the other uh -huh. to, to, to solve your issues. So if you run one, you don't get the solution, then try with the other ones. And you, didn't, don't need <laughs> you don't need to change the package manager. Do you also go through all of your problems that you have collected? I mean, you have yeah. a bit, pretty big database of existing problems yeah. that you are trying to solve. Um, and look which algorithm would be the best default. Yes, yeah. Uh, default, no, uh, I can show you, well, Maybe at the break, I can show you the, the output of the competition because all the data is in, 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 is in the open. You can find all the data they are published. Mm -hmm. And depending on the track, so what are your preferences? What are your configuration? Are you using just one release of the distribution? Are you using several sources of the distribution? Depending on that, one solver is better or the other is better. So it's, 
that's the reason why we really insist on having many solvers around, not just implement one particular strategy. I can show you. There is one, the best one up to date is ASP Kun. So overall, so best default, and that's the reason why, why you use this today. Okay. But there are situations where this doesn't work and you need to resort, for example, to PECAP or MCCS or something like this. And you see this ASP Code Solver allows you to specify very sophisticated preferences. So without entering into the detail, you can look at the, at the references I put, at the pointers in the slides, but this is almost readable. So I'm telling the solver, look, this is a universe you have to, to, to analyze with my request. This is a solution. Put the result in this file as a solution. And this is my preferences. So I, I'm saying minimize the, the count of the packages which are in the set down. What is it? Minimize the number of packages which are downgraded. Minimize the number of packages which are not up to date in the solution, so overall. Then please make sure you uh, minimize, uh, this is uh, historically aligned, should be unaligned. Minimize the number of packages which are not aligned when you consider the sources and the source version. So try to put all binaries that came from the same sources, try to have the same version. If you're a KDE user, you know what, what I mean, okay? So uh, you get the binary from 401, another binary from 411, and then your KDE doesn't start, okay? So that's pretty annoying. And then, for example, other issues, try to, to satisfy all recommends, and then uh, don't put in any new packages unless they are really necessary to, to satisfy everything else. So it's a very sophisticated preference in languages, and it is up to you. You just, what you need to do, you do it. And now it is, this formalism is used in P2, it is used at the, which is a provisioning platform for Eclipse. It is used for the OCaml package manager, so why not, why not? in SUSE packet manager, who knows. Uh, now when you have these preferences, you can play, start playing funding games, okay? Because, uh, for example, you can say here, uh, I want uh, to install a set of packages and all which is necessary to run these packages, but nothing else. So here I'm saying, minimize the sum of the field installed size in all packages in the solution that satisfy my thing. So imagine for an embedded system, that's pretty nice, okay? You, you, it gives for you immediately the minimum size. Or you can decide to install everything that can be installed together. Maximize the number of packages in your solution. Please fill up all my disk if you, want, if you want. You can repair a broken system very easily. So if your, your configuration got uh, astray, you can issue an empty request. I don't, re don't ask anything. I just want a solution with the minimal changes with respect to the current situation. This will fix my system. Uh, and the key school effect is that once you have this kind of preference languages around, all this extra functionality come at no price. You do not need to change the code of the package manager at all. It is just a matter of playing with the preference languages a, a bit. A another uh, key school effect was uh, at some point I was looking for a way of minimizing the size, the image size of virtual machine while well, just using this solver here around, it was pretty easy. You can go here on, on my GitHub account, you can download this Amy Thinner, and it allows you to build the minimal size uh, Amazon virtual machine uh, for, uh, for, uh, for a particular usage. Well, okay. So that was a user size. Okay, you can do things in this way in, in, uh, for users. Now, what about the maintainers of a distribution? The, the, the poor guys which are doing quality assurance, release management, all this kind of stuff. So we would like to help these people. So we started working with them, in particular in the Debian community. And the, our goal was to catch automatically all installation related errors and dependency related errors before they hit the users and before they, they, they hit the BTS. So for example, we wanted to find all the packages that cannot be installed at all. And probably when they cannot be installed at all, I would like to know who is to blame if there are packages which are not installed at all. Okay. Then I would like to know if there are packages which are incompatible. What are these incompatibilities? How they change? How they evolve? Can I use this information to automate package migration from, te from a testing environment to the stable environment, for example? Let's see each one of these. For example, 
Quality Assurance 101. Find, I give you your future SUSE release. Can you find there if there is any package that cannot be installable? Well, you would say easy. Just run your package manager on all of the packages in the, in the distribution. Try to install it one by one. Okay, but this means <laughs> solving tens of thousands of NP complete problems could be long. But in practice, for theoretical reasons I will not detail, I mean, in practice, the real instances you find are easy, so can be used, uh, can be uh, handled efficiently. But if you try to run, for example, zipper or DNF on all the packages in, the, in your distribution, it will take quite a bit of time. Each time you run it, okay, you read to parse all the metadata, do the installation, check everything. And if a package cannot be installed, it's not clear, you get a clear mess error message. Well, since 2006, we, uh, Jérôme Vuillon and our team developed a tool which can actually analyze more than 40,000 packages in a few seconds. Uh, at the coffee break, if you want, come and I will show you how easy it is to, to, to run it. And not only you find all broken packages, but if a package is broken, it tells you why. Okay. This has been incorporated in, in, uh, in Debian for the quality assurance. Now, for example, if you go there, qa.debian.org slash DOSE, you will find this nice weather forecast here that tells you, for example, that today is not a good day to try to install uh, packages from the ARM64 distribution because there are uh, 4,500 packages which are broken in that particular release there. And actually, if you click, if you click here, you get the list. And not only you get the list, but for each package, you get the explanation, a precise explanation of why the package cannot be installed. Uh, maybe I can take a few seconds to show you. Uh, where is my thing? You see, this is a Quay page. So all non-installable packages. Up, please network here. In unstable, for example. Uh -huh. So the situation got better since uh, when I took the picture a few days ago. Uh, here you have all the non-installable packages. And you see, for example, here this package is not installable in all versions because uh, there is an unsatisfied dependency on this particular thing here. But there are more interesting things like with conflicts. Let me see. Here, like for example, FPDNS cannot be installed because FPDNS depends on libnet DNS fingerprint Perl, which is satisfied by this package here, which depends on libdns Perl, which is satisfied by this package here. But it also depends on FPDNS, that other version you cannot have. Uh, and be these two things are in conflict between them, so they cannot put, be put together. So for a distribution manager, it's easy, looking at this, to go and see why there is this conflict there. I, am I missing a package? Did I forget to migrate a package in there? Or something like this. So that's... Uh, That's already in production. So the, of course, the release goal is to have zero non-installable packages. You, you don't want to ship to your clients packages which cannot be installed, of course. But this is uh, the experience of after years of using this is that, uh, for example, the, the people in the Embedian community use this tool before uploading packages to the repository. So they are sure there is no broken package in the repository. Uh, you can use this to check build dependencies before attempting to, to build a package on a test farm, for example. And for the people who do porting to other architectures, I mean, actual quote of what they say, this has been life-changing because you have a static tool that tells you, don't try this, don't try this, before running a, on a real test machine. Uh, you can generate test cases for finding errors. You, you identify file conflict, etc. So there are many, many bugs reported over time and solved automatically using these kind of tools. And then the advantage of these tools is that the report is generated in a few seconds. You can run it on your machine, on your laptop. You don't need a, a, a test farm for doing all this stuff. Level two. Okay, now I have found 
2,454 packages which are broken. Fantastic. What, what should I do? Uh, I start looking at the first one. There is a conflict with package this and package that, or this package is missing the dependencies. So I start writing to the maintainer of the first package and tell him, look, you should update your package. But maintainer said, no, no, not my fault. It's a fault of the library uh, over there, so call the maintainer on, on the other side. And the maintainer says, says, no, my library is perfectly fine. It's his package that needs to be updated. It's a nightmare. Okay, so can you find a way of blaming the, the real guy? Well, this, we try to do this, for example, with this particular notion of outdated packages. So a package is outdated if it is broken today and there is no way of fixing its dependencies by changing anything else but him. Okay? If I can show you that your package is broken and no matter what other maintainers are going to do, it will never be installable, then you are fault. And you are, you are at, uh, the responsible, you should fix it. Okay? So I, I skip the, the things here, but for example, in the outdated list in Debian, we, uh, we found uh, hundreds of issues that were uh, ended up being fixed thanks to this kind of uh, reports. And what's really important in this kind of work is that you can distinguish between uh, issues which are transient. Okay, the package is broken here, but as soon as a new version of this other library arrives, everything will work again, which is transient, so you don't worry. And permanent questions, which are, uh, I mean, this package is broken here, and there is no way it will be fixed unless the maintainer does something, in which case I can ping him and tell him, please, upgrade, upgrade your version or check your system. Now, just a, a, a little thing about the theory here. The properties that you are trying to, to ana analyze automatically seem strange because you are saying, I want to find, find all packages that cannot be fixed even if I change all other packages in all possible ways. This seems huge. Okay, changing all, I mean, I have 40,000 packages plus mine, and I wonder if changing the other 39,999 packages in any possible way can solve the issue or not. It's a huge search space, but well, it can be done, okay? You need some theory and you can do it efficiently. Actually, it requires a few minutes on my laptop just to, to execute uh, this, uh, this kind of check today. Okay, and this can be used properly. And then you have speculative, I skip this because I don't have time to go over this. So that was level one, it is just, okay, find me the broken packages, the one which cannot be installed and try to give me some information on why they cannot be installed. But there are more subtle issues. Like, for example, you can have all your packages in your distribution, all perfectly installable in isolation, but there can be sets of packages that cannot be installed together. For example, there was a moment in Debian where it was perfectly possible to install Tesseract OCR, which is a fantastic optical character recognition tool, and it was also perfectly possible to install just the English language pack for this uh, uh, binary, but it was not possible to install both of them together. So basically, all the English-speaking people in the world were unable to use this particular tool. Very nice for Italian like me. It's a way to push people to learn Italian, okay? But um, you see the problem. So everything is installable one by one, but not together. So you there, uh, of course you, have, you get errors in the ATS and then people going through this and takes weeks because you fix it. But is, a, is it a way to, to find this kind of incompatibilities automatically and before they hit the, and the BTS? Well, the point is that, of course, in principle, should package should be installed individually, but you find incompatibilities. Can we summarize them in a, in a, in a simple way? The answer is yes, yes, but it was really tough. I mean, so basically, uh, we developed a simplification theory that allows to convert your huge repository into a very, very small thing where you can spot all the incompatibilities. Uh, all, all incompatibilities are still represented in this smaller graph, uh, but since it is smaller, you can read it. While if you have uh, 40,000 nodes and hundreds of thousands of links, you can do nothing with this kind of stuff. 
So there, and the algorithm is so complicated, we even did a, a machine check at proof of this, so because we didn't believe uh, it was actually correct, so it is machine checked. So the, just in a word, tough math, okay? Tough math at work. Forget about it, just look at the tool. There is a fantastic tool you can download and use on your system today, which is called Coinst, uh, that allows you to, for example, say, look, Mr. Coinst, can you look at all the packages in here I'm interested in the package iSwizzle. Can you tell me every incompatibilities related to iSwizzle? And you, here you will discover that, for example, iSwizzle is in, cannot be installed as soon as you put uh, XUL X to Grid Monkey or XUL X to Gnome Key Ring or XUL X to Sage. Or as soon as you install this obscure package here, which is LibOSS4 Salsa Sound 2, you never heard about. Okay. So you, you go around and check these kind of things. These are not direct dependencies or direct conflicts. I mean, if you try to find this information by sifting through the uh, web pages, you can spend a week to, to find the connection. It has been synthesized for you. And uh, what about uh, KDE full, for example? Here you know that as soon as one of these packages here arrives, then KDE full cannot be installed. And actually, you can uh, even ask the tool to give you a full representation of the full status of Debian. You, you get this? I mean, seems unusable, seems. Actually, it is much, much better. Th this is representing 40,000 packages and 200,000 dependencies and conflicts. And here you have just a few hundred nodes and a few dozens of arrows. Uh, and you can actually go and play with this guy interactively. Let me try to, to do this for you a second. Uh, this, yeah. Okay. So this is exactly the same graph. So it seems unusable. But you start looking at things around and say, hmm, there is one guy here that seems interesting. By the way, it is pinpointed in red, okay? This special LibOSS4 Salsa A Sound 2 package, because it is incompatible with this package Lib A Sound 2 here, which actually represents 2,400 other packages. That means as soon as you get the other red guy installed, then 204,000 packages cannot be installed on your machines. Ha. Huh. So it catches your eye and you go and check and effect, uh, actually you discover that this package here should never have been put in this particular architecture. This is an emulation library for uh, uh, a sound, th the sound library that is only supposed to be used on specific architecture where you don't have uh, the real thing. So if you put in uh, i386 or AMD64 architecture, it will never be useful. It should never be there, should never be used. And as soon as a user tries to, to install it, because he doesn't know, I mean, you just look for, for a, the sound library, it tries to disinstall half of your system. Okay, so it should be removed. But it is installable. He is installable, of course. Simply, he is not installable together with all the rest of the things. And there are many other things that you can go around or check. Uh, I, uh, see compatibility and compatibility to a particular user like here. Like for example, here you have all the different sets of different FTP servers which are available, which are of course all incompatible one with the other. Okay. So nice games that you can play here. Let, let, let me speed up a bit. Uh, so you can check this. Uh, if you run a coinst on smaller distribution like Ubuntu, you can get much more readable results. There are many, much less packages around. There's 7,000 packages, 30,000 dependencies on Ubuntu boiled down to this simple graph. And if you zoom it, you can see all the different incompatibilities and check them one by one. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting at time zero. So I have a distribution. I want to know whether I have incompatibilities that look strange. I go around and check them. And this is manageable today. But there is another issue, which is, for example, hey, what about changes over time? So I know all the packages which are compatible or incompatible yesterday, 
Then somebody added some new stuff today. Are you able to tell me what changed in terms of compatibilities, for example? Uh, this is much more interesting because in just, instead of just looking at the situation at some moment, which can be huge, I just look at what changes. And here, for example, imagine that yesterday you had this package A that had some dependencies and the package B that has some dependencies. Uh, tonight, somebody added a new version of A that has an incompatibility with B. So you know, all of a sudden, A and B becomes incompatible. And then immediately, all these packages here become incompatible with all these packages here, which can be bad. And it was a Tesseract situation over time. It was exactly this. Right? So if we find a way to present you all the changes in a compact way, then you can check what changes and say, ah, this is a problem or this is not a problem. Again, here, the mathematics be behind that is hard because uh, you, you see, you should, in principle, you should take all the subsets of 40,000 packages of yesterday, check them if they are co-installable or not, then all the subsets of the 40,000 packages today, check them if they are co-installable co or not, and compare with uh, yesterday. But all the subset of 40,000 packages, 2 to the 40,000, which is a bit huge. Okay. Of course, you don't do this. Uh, you do something else. And so we, you can use another variant of the coinst tools, which is coinst upgrades. You can download it there. And then this tool presents you very nice little graphs like these ones. This says, look, with respect to yesterday, I had found a new incompatibility. I mean, this UNOCONV and Python UNO, Python UNO are no longer installable together. And the strange dots here are telling you the new version of UNOCONV has a dependency on any version, this is a solid line of Python UNO, Python 3 UNO, that has a conflict solid line on any version yesterday and today of Python UNO. So this new dependency here that has been added makes a new version of UNOCONV incompatible with Python UNO. Ah, maybe it's fine, maybe it's not. Let me check. But this information is clearly presented to me. Here is another situation that there are arose at the mom one moment in time, which was very funny. I mean, the new version of TDSODBC all of a sudden becomes incompatible with DBIODBC2 any version. Somebody added a new version of the package that say conflicts with everything in the by So you look at the report and say, you see that this libiodbc 2 is some old stuff nobody's maintaining, has been maintaining for years. Uh, so maybe the easy solution is just to drop it. Okay, drop this old package. But then you discover that you need some context to understand what is going on. So if you look at the details, you will discover that even this has been non-maintained for years, you have 380 packages that are actually depending on it. So it is not a good idea to remove this. You just need to solve the conflict. And one of the packages that depends on this is Conqueror, Network Manager, KDE, K Organizer, Printer, I mean, the kind of things you don't want to lose. So this is another tool which is extremely useful, can produce the answer in, in, in extremely short time. You can play with, again, uh, with it directly again on your machine, 40,000 packages on one side yesterday, 40,000 packages on, on the other side today. You get the answer in a few seconds, which is impressive. Okay? But, and, and you get your pictures. And then last, last slide, which I will just flash to you uh, at some point. The last, last version of this coinst uh, suite was, can we use all this information to automate the migration of packages from an unstable version, I mean the development version of the, the distribution to the one which is undergoing stabilization like testing in Debian. So uh, of course we want to have all the packages migrating rapidly there, but I want to keep testing stable, as stable as possible. So when I migrate a package here, I do not want to see installation issues arising. I do not want to see new co-installability issues arising, but now I have the tools that tell me how to check if whether there is a new co-installability issue around, so I can do it. And so when I skip this part, uh, 
basically this is a tool which can completely replace Britney, if you, if you know Debian, what it is. Uh, it produces a report prevent of uh, all the issues preventing package migration with nice explanation in the form of the graph you have seen. Uh, it is based on a nice feedback loop between a Boolean solver and the co-installability tools we have seen. And uh, just to give you an example of efficiency, because in general, maybe you are uh, used to, to see people doing research and develop nice prototypes that take ages to run, and they know nothing about engineering, so it's no point of talking to these guys. Well, these are actual figures uh, running on, uh, on uh, all the upgrade, uh, I mean, all the migration issues you have seen in Debian for quite a while, I mean, daily for three months, and these are the points. So co-migrate is this new tool developed by JGON. So if you add be, uh, enable all the uh, extra feature caching, etc., he's able to compute a migration on 12 architecture, 40,000 package by architectures in uh, five seconds on your laptop. Well, I suppose your laptop has a multi-core, otherwise I mean one will take a bit, a bit more. That's Brittany. Okay. And there are some points which are way out of the picture because in some times, for example, when there, were, when there was a pair transition up to there, the, the, compute, the, the algorithm took more than 24 hours just to compute the result. Okay. So I'm concluding. Let me conclude over this. It was quick. I just wanted to give you some um, overview of the kind of things we are doing. You know, the example above, you have seen people trying to identify a problem, a problem which is interesting for the people maintaining the distribution, requiring some research effort, try to work hard to find a solution, implement a tool, validate it on uh, real world cases, publish a research article. Each of these tools has an article pu published uh, on it and then try to foster adoption. Di dis discuss with the people in the distribution to, to, uh, to see if they find it useful, adapt it if they need something more. So in a picture, again, I, I, s I hope to have convinced you that this diagram here is not just advertising, it's the reality. I mean, we are really trying to do this uh, as much as we can. And so to conclude, uh, my point of view is that free software is really something that is going to be present everywhere, and, but since it is everywhere, it is growing, and you know, everything that grows brings new problems. And these new problems can be interesting. Research problem for researchers, when you do quality assurance, look at what Julia has done, which uh, many other people are doing. Uh, I'm just closing. And, uh, and I hope this can be the basis for a very fruitful co collaboration. So I would like to invite you, all of you, if you have idea, if you like this kind of approach, don't hesitate to get in touch. It really is now is kind of a new place. I mean, we, we are not so many people, okay, but it's a kind of a philosophy we want to foster. I mean, try to work together uh, on new issues that can uh, arise, solve new problems, build valuable tools, and sharing a dream, which is make a free software the best software in town, okay, in, uh, at the end. And in particular, on distributions, I mean, if you are interested in distribution, of course, we have already built many powerful tools in, uh, for quality assurance in the Linux distribution. Of course, we have done most of this work in collaboration with Debian because some people in our team are Debian developers, so it was easy to, to, to understand immediately what were the needs. But we really, really care about being distribution agnostic or neutral. So most of the tools I have shown you are actually distribution neutral. You can run them on anything else. If you look at the web page for Coinst, you will see there are graphs like this one, which are drawn for Debian, for Mandriva, for uh, Ubuntu, for, uh, I'm sure it's pretty easy to, to, to do the same for Red Hat or SUSE. It's just a matter of getting the metadata of the packages somewhere. Right? You have package readers for RPM format, etc. Some others are not, because they were very specific to a quality process in Debian, but they can be adapted and ported. So basically, I, I'm finished now. Here you have just an excerpt of some published paper, pointers to some of these tools. There are more in the, in, in the loop. And uh, I, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm open for questions if you have any. So thanks. <laughs> There is a question there.
So you said you are looking for new problems, so maybe I can give you one. So, uh, you know, Gentoo Linux yeah. is a source distribution, so there you have a problem that you, for example, upgrade to the X server and you have to rebuild all the drivers. Not upgrade, just rebuild, because yeah. the ABI is different. And for a long time, the package manager didn't even uh, solve this. You had some external tool to find what's broken and needs to be rebuilt. Now it can do it, but it's very slow. So is this kind of problem expressible in, you, in your CUDF, or is it something you could add? Actually, uh, there is a, uh, there is a, I didn't spend time on this, but there is a new package manager for a particular programming language, which is, which is OCaml, which is a programming language which is used to, be, to, to write Coxinel and some of our tools. This package manager is called Open, and it is a source-based package manager. So we had exactly the same problem there. So not only you need to compile something, but you need to recompile something else. You need to install something, and this forces you to install something else and recompile something else. So uh, the same technology is built inside. So these kind of solvers can be used to, to, um, to do half of the work. They will not provide you with the recompilation plan. But the recompilation plan can be computed easily with a separate tool. So if you look at how this OPAM tool is built, um, we basically know how to do this also. Uh, I'm not able to provide you a tool which replaces the tools in Gen2 today. But I, we, know, we have the basic knowledge to do this. Properly. So if you're interested, just come and talk to me, no problem. Okay, time to get a coffee. Thanks a lot for, for being here. <laughs>